welcome everybody back into Carson Cries into the Microphone for an hour. As always, I'm a common fool, and alongside me is Logan Camden. And Logan, before I get into a whole monologue about the miserable series of events that I've been through, I want to let you get a word in. How you doing today? <laughs> uh, Carson, I'm fantastic. Uh, I, I'm blessed oh, that we get to nice. see such a great quarterback battle between the two best quarterbacks in the National Football League. Yeah. Uh, how are you holding up, my man? Not great. And by the way, that was a bit more than a word, but I'll let it slide. Yeah, I'm not doing so hot, man. I'm over here up by Rochester, New York. I went to the Bills game. I'm a Bills fan. For those of you who don't know, as you can tell by this beanie that I foolishly purchased. Look at these gloves, too. What an idiot. What did I think this was? Some sort of holiday special. And I flew all the way out here across country. And yesterday, trudged out there in the snow. And it was cold, but honestly, the cold really wasn't a factor. Once I was in that environment, I thought, this is electric. You get in there and you feel invincible. Fitzmagic is two rows in front of us with his seven children and his monstrous masculine beard and positive energy. I tweeted about this. They started playing Bruno Mars' 24 Karat Magic, and I found myself singing along, Logan. And I quickly snapped out of it. I caught myself, and I looked around and hoped that nobody noticed. But the energy was that infectious and that positive. Mm -hmm. And then, fast forward three hours, things didn't go so hot. And then I had a four-hour drive back because, as I said, we're staying up closer to Rochester. Ooh. We're not in Buffalo because that's where we have quarters. So I returned to my barracks. I'm sleeping on literally a cot here, a miserable cot. I returned to my barracks after four hours in the car, during which morale was as low as I've ever seen. There was a time where we were riding high, Logan. The troop that I was with, we were referring to ourselves as Strike Force 85, and we meant something. We were completing missions, we were bringing positive energy, and we were just a remnant of what we once were by the end of that ride. And I sat there, and I said, when it's too tough for them, it's just right for us, a Bill's classic saying. And then I said, where else would you rather be than right here, right now? And everybody exists. Everybody agreed that they would rather be dead in a ditch somewhere. So then I returned here. The Wi-Fi was out. Couldn't record a show. Here we are today. The Wi-Fi is actually still out, but we're making it work. So that's been uh, the totality of my experience. It's been great. What did you have to say about this game? Logan, what stands out to you? Uh, a few things. One, the Chiefs have Patrick Mahomes. Uh, shout out True. Dave Swartz for coining that motto. That's why I would never bet against Patrick Mahomes in an individual playoff setting. Uh, he's been the starting quarterback for six seasons. He's going to advance to his sixth AFC title game uh, in his career. It's really what remarkable. Uh, the one thing I want to get off my the one thing I want to get off my chest here is uh, I think we need to talk about Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes and. I see a lot of sentiments across the league nowadays talking about just trashing Josh Allen again, talking about, uh, I saw Ryan Clark specifically said that, oh, Josh Allen isn't a winner. Oh, he's, why do we keep praising this guy? He's not LeBron. He's not this. He's not that. He's, and he's not a winner. I don't get how you can watch the totality of that football game and then pin the loss solely on the shoulders of Josh Allen. He did everything and anything possible to put his team in a position to win this football game. And when you look at his complete playoff track record, Carson, as a uh, struggling and suffering Bills fan, I'm assuming you have yeah. the totality of the numbers here for Josh in playoff games. Josh has been great in basically every playoff game at every turn. Yeah. And I think it's just really wrong that we uh, attribute these losses individually to him. What did he do on that final drive, Carson? He put them in a position to tie the football game up, and Tyler Bass did a very Buffalo Bills thing and pushed yeah. a field goal wide right. You could see it coming. I mean, the wind was whipping on that play. That's just where I want to start, Carson. A lot of people seem to be wanting to take shots and, and take victory laps on Josh Allen, and I just think you're stupid uh, if you're doing that. Mm -hmm. We got to see Tom Brady and Peyton Manning, and I think that is the – one of the greatest quarterback duels that we ever got to see. I think Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes is the best. Uh, it was a great football yeah. game between the two best quarterbacks in the National Football League. I think they're two of the greatest I've ever seen. And Josh played his ass off. I don't get how people are taking uh, victory laps. An interesting uh, final stat that I, I, I want to give before I turn it over to you, Carson. Uh, Carson, the Bills had never lost a game before uh, when Josh didn't turn the ball over. They were 17-0 and in the Josh Allen era when he didn't turn the rock over. Wow. They are now 17-1. and I mean, he played a near flawless football game, uh, and this loss is not on Josh Allen's shoulders. I totally agree with that. 
But before I start defending Josh, which I'm very prone to do, and let me tell you, in the long run, is going to prove to be the correct side of the debate to be on, I do want to give props to the Kansas City Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes because he is the best mm -hmm. quarterback ever to me. And we did our rankings of, like, the top 10 quarterbacks last year, and I said that I thought he was the best, that he had, had the highest peak, that he had the most unique blend of dominant, mm -hmm. unmatched physical tools with this incredible cerebral mastery of the game. And then I ranked him, like, six or something because I was like, yeah, the other guys just have more longevity. It's one of the dumbest things I've ever done. He's already top two for me. He is a top two quarterback of all time, and his peak is number one. There is an inevitability here, a consistency here that is unmatched. Shout out to Brady, but the direct responsibility that Pat has for so much of the Chiefs' success. He has a really good defense this year, but historically he hasn't had these loaded, inevitably top 10 defenses. He's going to give you 30 points a game in the playoffs. He's going to do it without a great run game necessarily. Like, the dude has played the position flawlessly for six years now, basically. And this wasn't his most impressive game. He didn't necessarily dominate this game. He even left a couple throws on the table early on that first red zone drive, but he was efficient. He consistently made the right throws. He consistently made timely plays. His running backs were also phenomenal. They averaged eight yards a carry in this game, Logan, which opens up a whole other can of worms about the Bills' defense that we have to get into. But over the totality of his playoff career, where we now have a nice, clean 16-game sample size, Patrick Mahomes has thrown for 4,561 yards, 38 touchdowns to seven interceptions with another 443 rushing yards and five touchdowns, a 13-3 and record. Those are numbers that would be an outstanding MVP season against your average NFL competition in a regular season. This is what he has done in the most high-stakes scenarios against the best teams in the NFL. The guy's a superhero, and for all the praise that I have heaped upon Josh Allen, deservedly so still, I'm not moving off any of that, the one thing I have never said is that he is better than Patrick Mahomes because he's not. And uh, he's a very good number two, but nobody touches what Mahomes can do. And because of that, the Chiefs can absolutely beat anybody. And that's the reality, and that's something that you've held strong on with this team. When you have this defense and you have Patrick Mahomes, you can beat anybody. And yesterday showed us that. It's the reason that I've never lost faith in the Kansas City Chiefs. I've never wavered in it throughout this entirety of the season, no matter what the receiving struggles, with the close games that they lost. Uh, you know, you call him a superhero, Carson. I think Pat Mahomes is the new supervillain. You say inevitable. Yeah. When I think of Patrick Mahomes, I, and I said this in the pre, uh, before the playoffs when we were leading up to this, there is an inevitability, Carson. I think that's the exact oh, yeah. right word that it feels like. It is a sinking feeling in your stomach that Mahomes is about to make the most soul-wrenching play. He's going to take mm -hmm. your heart out, and he's going to eat it uh, because that's what Mahomes does. He's Thanos. He is the big baddie of the NFL. He is the dragon that you have to slay. He is the beast that you have to conquer. Like, that's why I would never bet against him. And, yes, there's an inevitability. I never felt... No matter how many times the Bills were running the ball down the Chiefs' throat, no matter how big plays that Josh Allen made, crazy Khalil Shakir catches, I always felt like Patrick Mahomes was looming. He's the grim reaper, man. Like, Mahomes mm -hmm. is just... That is the status that he has earned himself in this league. And, uh, again, I mean, I, I think it speaks to it, Carson, that with all of the offensive issues... I mean, this is the lowest that I think the NFL has collectively been on the Kansas City Chiefs, and... Yet it yeah. still feels to me like they are the best team in, in football. Um, I, I will never do it, Carson. This is why. I will never bet against Patrick Mahomes. For the next 10 years, please do not get mad at me. If I pick the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl every year, it's because of that guy. It's because of Patrick yeah. Mahomes. It's going to take a hell of a lot for me to ever lose faith in that team. And I have always been a believe in Mahomes, no matter what kind of guy. Last season was the year when everybody was down on them before it started because they had lost Tyreek and that was oh my god look at these other AFC West teams that could seize the opportunity the Chargers and the Chiefs offense is going to regress and they still had the number one scoring offense in football and they still won the Super Bowl and that's because of Patrick Mahomes and his unrivaled impact on the game but I did think if there was a year to pick somebody else this would be the one and I actually still think the Ravens are a better football team. Who knows if the Mahomes factor just completely outweighs that. I'm probably going to pick Baltimore, stick with my gut instinct on that. But 
that's pretty close to a toss-up. And I felt like this game was a toss-up. And it really is the little things on the margins that make the difference in a game like this. Obviously, the missed field goal. You can't miss a 44-yarder. If you're a Bills kicker, you certainly can't do it wide right. But I also can't pretend like that's shocking because Tyler Bass hasn't been good this year. And since this point in mid-October, he's basically been like low 70s in terms of percentage on his field goals. He missed two last week, Logan. One of them was blocked. But if you want to talk about foreshadowing from up above, that's a game that the Bills are going to comfortably win no matter what. So you can sort of dismiss it. It's not a factor. In a game like this, it certainly is. And having a reliably good kicker is such a luxury that so few teams have. And it is so brutal and so painful and so nerve-wracking when you don't have it. The Packers just had the same thing with Anders Carlson. It was a really weak performance from the Bills' defense as well. Where, of course, they're down a bunch of guys. And we knew that going in. But just couldn't get stops in this game. Didn't get a stop in the first half. Their clutchest play was really getting bailed out with that strip on the goal line. So they were able to get possession back when otherwise that was very likely going to be seven Chiefs points. And then they got off the field one more time after that. But even if Bass had made that field goal, tie game with a minute 40 seconds left, Patrick Mahomes has two timeouts. He just needs a field goal against this defense. I would still say there's an 80% chance that the Chiefs win that game in regulation. And there's game, I mean, it was awful tackling. You had a really bad blown coverage on that Kelsey TD. He just walks in. I wouldn't put this on the pass rush, but they didn't get much pressure. I didn't really think that either pass rush got, like, meaningful pressure much in this game. The Bills had one series where they were getting after Pat, and it got them off the field. So, good for them. One timely play. But overall, just not nearly good enough. And that's what's so hilarious about people pinning this on Josh. It's like, surely it's on the guy who's been a superhuman and has barely turned the ball over and has averaged 300 and something yards per game of total offense in these matchups and multiple touchdowns. And it's not on a defense allowing 36 points per game to the Kansas City Chiefs over these three playoff matchups. That's just where you can't reasonably look at yourself and put it on Josh if you have an understanding of what's going on out there on the field. That's not to say that he's been as good as Mahomes. He certainly was in the 13 seconds game. But overall, Mahomes has been slightly better. But it's a question of a, a better team and particularly a Bills defense that has really struggled in these matchups. And the Chiefs defense stepped the hell up in the second half, man. I was watching. I had what you kids might call the all-22, okay? It's called actually being at the game and having a full field view. And dudes were just not open downfield for the Bills. That secondary was nails. Guys were not separating. And the Chiefs shut down that between the tackles run game and the bills had been running the football so well in the first half it was a majority of their offense they were leaning on it and uh, that just went away and that's where the little things like i would have wanted the ball to be in josh's hands on basically every play of that final drive because the run game became a bit predictable and it was really rendered ineffective and you just kept getting behind the sticks and josh would make these incredible plays on third down but at the end of the day, you can only get behind the stick so many times. And on that final series, I mean, you run the ball on the first play. It's stuffed for one. So you set up second and nine. And then people talk about Josh being too aggressive after the two-minute warning. And I think that this is a criticism that comes from a preconceived notion. I think this happens a lot with people watching sports. They have their take beforehand. And then they will hunt with that eagle eye to skew whatever argument they can to support the take that they already had. And people have this perception that Josh is a guy who always wants to hit the home run. And he doesn't want to play a surgical football game. That's what he did all game. But on second down, he has Khalil Shakir for a touchdown. He had him. How could you say that that was the wrong play? He had him. He missed the throw. He missed the throw. That pocket got a little bit crowded. He got a little bit sped up on his internal clock. Threw that ball a little bit early. The touchdown was there. He was breaking open. Nobody would criticize that if he makes the throw. So the decision-making is not the problem there. And then third down, I've seen people be like, oh, the underneath stuff was open. It was. W really, though? You want him to go on third down season on the line short of the sticks? He's supposed to take six yards on a third and nine? Like, maybe these thoroughly mediocre skill position players make somebody miss, but I'm all right with him trying to hit the big play there. I'm all for him trying to get the first down. And... Even if he does hit the guy for six yards, right? Okay, so you set up 
fourth and three, maybe you go for it then. It's more manageable. You move it from a 44-yard field goal to a 38-yard field goal. Would have mattered, maybe. Shouldn't matter for an NFL kicker. Like, those just aren't good outcomes. <laughs> and if he had taken those throws, people probably would have said, what is Josh doing? Why is he throwing short of the sticks? Mm-hmm. Well, and that's what I'm saying. It's all within the context of what actually happened on the field. Tyler Bass missed the field goal. Yep. The only reason that you're going back and even looking at those plays is because he missed the kick. And then yep. we have to switch the blame and shift it totally. from Bass to Josh Allen because they lost by three. If Tyler Bass makes that field goal, and then in the scenario that you laid out where Mahomes does what he always does because he's Thanos, he marches down the field, they get three points, well, yeah. then we're just looking at this through the scope of – People are going to do two things. They're one, they're going to blame the Bills' defense, but two, then they're going to go, oh, well, Josh didn't get the touchdown. It's on him because people yep. just hate on Josh Allen for some reason. It's all because of exactly what – it's so dumb to me, man. I, we shouldn't even view it like that. And if Tyler Bass makes that field goal, we're not looking at it like this. Yeah, it is such results-based thinking. And I get that football is a results-based business, but you just have to look at the factors and you have to look at who's actually responsible. And it's certainly not primarily Josh. Like, yeah, he should make that throw. And so that's on him. But to extrapolate that and say, this is on Josh Allen. Every time the Bills have lost to the Chiefs is on Josh Allen. The reason that the Bills don't have a Super Bowl is on Josh Allen. You are completely missing the point. Because like you said, Logan, of course, I do have Josh Allen's career playoff stats up in front of me. Passing over 272 yards a game, 21 touchdowns to four interceptions, rushing 563 yards, five touchdowns. He's playing consistently at an elite level, at a level that no one other than Mahomes has touched in the playoffs over this last half decade. And he's done it in adverse circumstances. And this is another one of those situations with a defense that is just clearly inferior. And when Diggs is playing at this level, dude, it's tough. There's nobody approaching a number one on the field. And I don't know if Diggs is legitimately hampered by injury but this has been a weird stretch from him and his involvement in the Bills offense has deliberately changed and I was all for Joe Brady becoming less singularly reliant on Diggs and trying to unlock other weapons more Dalton Kincaid Khalil Shakir James Cook in both the run game and the passing game but we're now at a 12 game stretch Logan where Stephon Diggs has been the number three receiver for this team. I tweeted this out. Shakir and Kincaid both have more yards and more touchdowns than your superstar receiver, Stephon Diggs. First play of this game, you drop a bubble screen for him. He fumbles. Josh makes the throw of a lifetime, dude. 65 yards downfield on the money, and Diggs doesn't come down with it. It's not an easy play. It's a play you have to make in a playoff game against the Chiefs. It's a play if you're Stephon Diggs, you 100% have to make so uh, that was just sort of painful watching this game there really are so many spots where you're like man there is just nobody open downfield or it's all right Josh put the throw where it needed to be throw to Sherfield as well was unbelievable and he just doesn't come up with it and it wasn't just that big play too Carson for most of the game my friends and I kept talking like where is Diggs like he was yeah. getting locked all game long, like in terms of yards. creating separation and getting open. Yeah, I, and big credit because I know this is a very tough matchup. I mean, you legitimately have multiple uh, all pro first team secondary members on the Chiefs. Granted, not all of them were, you know, on the team, but they're that right. caliber of player. So I get yeah. it's a tough matchup, but you're exactly right. In these big time moments, it's when your big time players have to step up and make those plays. And that's a perfect example. The entire uh, I was watching the game at a sports bar. The entire bar stood up. Like, we were 100% certain that ball was getting completed to Diggs, and it goes yeah. right between his hands. Yeah. And it sucks, Carson, because uh, yeah, I know you've said this uh, throughout this year, that 29 other teams are going to lose the Super Bowl. A bunch of other people are going to take victory laps on the teams that lost it. And that's really the reality of one of the toughest QB errors of football. I don't think that people realize this. We were spoiled, Carson, for a long time with – Breeze with Matt Ryan with Philip Rivers with Eli with mm -hmm. Big Ben you know and I, I'm sure there's people that I'm forgetting we're entering this new era of QB talent that is going to be oh, really yeah. hard to get rings and you think about guys that get walled off Dan Marino is the prime example when it comes to getting walled mm -hmm. off and not winning a Super Bowl and it is becoming exponentially harder every single year and it is going to be I think this next stretch for the next 10 to 15 years is going to be the most impressive Super Bowl window ever especially if you're coming out of the AFC and if you can slay 
the dragon that is Patrick Mahomes. Mm -hmm. Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, C.J. Stroud, Trevor Lawrence. Like, uh, I'm sure there's uh, more quarterbacks than I'm forgetting. Like, uh, whoever comes away, it's going to mean so much more. And it also, uh, I I don't know. Carson, for you guys, I just feel bad for Bills fans in the sense that you guys have the biggest monkey on your back in all of sports. Like, there are going to be so many demons that are going to be exercised once you guys can finally get over this hump whenever it is. But Mm -hmm. the weight of the world is on Josh Allen's shoulders, man, and you can almost sense it in every playoff game. That I mean, he knows what narrative is going to form if they lose this game. Uh, Yeah. I think... I think it's the biggest monkey on any fan bases back in sports, man. Like, you guys desperately have to get this done, and it's waning. Like, the the only teams that you guys have lost to are the Chiefs and the Bengals. The Bills have vanquished every other opponent, but they just Mm -hmm. can't get past Kansas City and Cincinnati. What I'm getting at is it's really freaking hard to win a Super Bowl. It's really freaking hard to win a Super Bowl out of the AFC when you're going up against Patrick Mahomes, and it's only going to get harder every single year moving forward. Like... Uh, this is we're entering into what I think is going to be the toughest era of QB competition, maybe in football history. I agree, and that's what I can't stop thinking about. The AFC is going to be so brutal. And by the way, I am quite confident with what we've seen from the NFC teams compared to the AFC teams that the winner of the AFC this year is going to win the Super Bowl. And the reality is that yeah. more years than not, that's probably going to be Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs. But this year, the Ravens are a juggernaut. I think they're the best team in football. They have a superstar quarterback who is also in that tier one group. It's just ridiculous. But the Bills had their chances, and Josh made spectacular plays. He is the best in the league at doing that basically fake run like he gets up to the line of scrimmage as if he's going to scramble and then he throws it mm-hmm. to a guy or of course he does the opposite where he pump fakes and then he makes the most dude, out of the scramble that one Did that twice sorry, in this dude, game that one far play that one far yeah. play man where he gets all nasty. three defenders to come right to him and he just flips it mm-hmm. out to the flat nasty dude he along with Mahomes of course just has a different level of improvisational instincts than anybody else. Those two are the most creative football players that I've ever seen. And I think that that brings so much more good than bad. But other special plays, dude, that third and 13, when the Bills needed a touchdown uh, to get to 24, rolling out to his left, somehow makes that throw into the tiniest window. It's an awesome catch by Shakir as well. But I was just watching that, and like real time I had my – Hands on my head. I'm like, great. This play's been blown up. Like, there's nothing there. And he just finds something, man. He consistently finds something when it shouldn't be there. Every short yardage situation, when the ball was in his hands, he executed. And consistently was getting extra yardage. It's third and two, fourth and two. That man is such a wild man. He's getting you six. He's bowling through defensive linemen. Like, and then you have the throws to Diggs and Sherfield that unfortunately aren't uh, converted on. But... He gave you 258 total yards, three touchdowns, no turnovers, converted on seven of 14 third downs, two of two fourth downs, and consistently led methodical, controlled drives throughout this game. And he put the offense in position to tie it at the end. So I just don't see how this falls on Josh. And when you talk about how incredibly difficult it is to win Super Bowls in this era, specifically to beat Patrick Mahomes, because he is the one-man dynasty right now. You know how Joe Burrow beat him? He got two picks from his defense, one of which put them immediately in scoring position, and his kicker was nails and made four field goals. Other dudes stepped up. You know how Brady beat him in the Super Bowl? They had an all-time defensive performance, made Mahomes by far the most uncomfortable I have ever seen him. Other dudes dominated. Other dudes played at an elite level. And at the end of the day, that's what you're going to need. Even if you do just outplay Mahomes straight up, which is incredibly difficult on its own, other dudes need to play at a really high level. And that has been the ultimate limitation for this Bills team. They've been Josh Allen or bust. And Josh can play really well, but against a team like this, you just need more. You need your defense to get stops. And it never felt like they could in this game. And that was ultimately the difference. I will also say this didn't end up costing them because they got the fumble into the end zone. But what the hell was the fake punt, dude? Like, are you kidding me, Sean McDermott? Oh, Fourth my Fourth and gosh. five on your own yeah. 30? I get that you don't want to give the Chiefs the ball, and you want to 
keep your offense out on the field because it's that kind of game. But come on, man. Like, in that situation, you're going to give them the ball on your 30? Because that felt like the pretty obvious outcome with the direct snap to DeMar Hamlin, which, by the way, I saw somebody tweet, it felt like Sean McDermott thought that he was in a Disney movie. And in the moment, that was my thought. I was like, is he, like, trying to make a statement? Like, is he trying to have a storybook ending here? That's an unserious play call. A completely unserious play call. I don't... Re- I don't really care the scenario. I, I'm always uh, show your cards at the line of scrimmage unless it's like fourth and one or fourth and two. In that mm-hmm. scenario, I am putting the ball in my best player's hands if I'm yeah. going to go for it. One, I just I just wouldn't have gone for it in that scenario yeah. because I think it was a stupid call. I'm punting mm-hmm. the ball. But two, if I am going to go for it, I am going chalk at the line of scrimmage. We're going to line up in the shotgun, and I'm giving that ball to – the big, beautiful Josh Allen, and I'm letting him give me the first down. Like, I could, Carson, I couldn't believe my eyes. That's one of the dumbest play calls I've ever seen. I totally agree with that philosophically, and I felt that way with the Chiefs, too. Sometimes they get cute, and it's, oh, what if we what if we ran an end around to McCole Hardman, or what if we did a direct snap to Noah Gray? <laughs> it's like, put the ball in Patrick Mahomes' hands. Put the ball in Josh Allen's hands if you're going to, but don't do it in that situation. It's desperate. It's unnecessary. And frankly, it was embarrassing. So what's next for the Bills, Logan? Where do they go from here? I was going to ask you the same question. I mean, it sucks for you guys because you have to keep running this thing back and you have to keep hitting your head on the wall, excuse me, on the ceiling until you break through. Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to ask you specifically after this game, especially, I think this is kind of timely after we're talking about that play call, is McDermott, I mean, I, can you fire him? Oh, I wish, Logan. I wish. But I really don't think that's going to happen. I think the Bagulas really like him. They extended him through 2028, so that's a lot of money down the drain. And... Uh, I think they can take the overall very positive finish to this season. Like, of course, this leaves a sour taste in your mouth. This was devastating. This was heartbreaking. But we have to remember where the Bills were nine weeks ago. This team was 6-6. Six and six. They were coming off of a series of mind-bending losses. And they won six straight. And for all we know, they could be the team that gives Kansas City the best punch of anybody in this field. So, because of that, I don't think it will happen. But I certainly would not mind if it did. Okay, follow up on that. Uh, considering that you did get to see an extended uh, stint with him as the new offensive coordinator, do you want to bring back Joe Brady? Is he your guy moving forward? I'm good with bringing back Joe Brady because I don't think that we're going to be able to bring in some guy who's on like a head coaching candidate level, right? Those dudes are going to go take head coaching jobs. And I think that Brady did improve this offense. I think committing to the run more overall was a positive. They made this offense more balanced, and James Cook is really good. I just think in this game, maybe it was a bit overly conservative. It was a bit too much leaning on the run late. Just a few plays where you're past that point of like, okay, this isn't working anymore. Just keep the ball in Josh's hands. I think that overall, involving other weapons more, spreading the wealth beyond just the Allen-Diggs connection was a positive. It just happened to be unfortunate that in this game, and Diggs wasn't good. You're down Gabe Davis. I don't like Gabe Davis. I've almost never said a positive thing about Go- Gabe Davis since the four-touchdown game against the Chiefs. But it would be nice to have him out there when the alternatives are Sherfield. And then Shakir goes down with an injury at one point. And Deontay Hardy has to come into the game. Like, when those dudes are your numbers two and three receivers and Diggs is going for 21 yards, that sucks. But I think overall... Even if the numbers don't meaningfully reflect it, I felt better about this offense as the year went along, and I do like Joe Brady. But looking beyond that, I think there's a real chance that Diggs is gone. We've heard the things that he said about wanting to be elsewhere, not outright, but just the strong implications, the tweets from his brother, all this stuff. And I think that this may just be at a place where you're ready for a mutual parting of ways. I could see the Bills being tired if he tries to bring that drama. And frankly, with the level that he played at down the home stretch this year, he didn't play like a star number one receiver. He was your number three receiver over the last 12 games. So I have been a proponent of no matter what, with Diggs or without Diggs, you go receiver in the first round this year. I think that has to be the priority again. Von Miller, Maybe the worst contract in NFL history. I really do wonder. Like, 
of course, we talk about quarterbacks. We talk about Deshaun. We talk about Russ because those contracts are so massive. But Von Miller is a useless football player. His stat line this year was comical. When he got out there, it literally felt like he was moving at half speed for a vast majority of the season. I can't think of a Von Miller pressure this entire year. And so you got to take, I think it's like $32 million of dead cap over the next couple years, but you cut him. I, you open up like $6 million of cap or something. I don't know. Whatever's not fully guaranteed is worth opening up to cut Von Miller because that dude sucks. And he's dealing with a domestic violence allegation out there. Like, fuck him. I don't want him on my football team. And then I think you need to look at some of the other veteran dudes on this defense who we highlighted before the year. Like, Micah Hyde, it seems like, might be done. There was sort of a vibe of this could be his last game in Buffalo. Jordan Poyer, those dudes have been alongside each other for seven years, Logan. Can you believe that? A safety tandem together, just churning out excellence for seven years. But they're old now. And they were still good this year, but they certainly weren't what they were at their peak. So I could see that being a spot that the Bills retool. It's going to be about adding a high-end weapon offensively and uh, I think figuring out the back end of this defense, the safeties, if those dudes move on. But that's what sucks is like, how do you even make a real assessment of this defense when so many dudes were out? Because with how Terrell Bernard stepped up this year, with Matt Milano back, like I feel pretty good about the totality of this linebacking core. Trey White, who knows? He's had two major injuries now. I don't know what he can be. But Benford stepped up. Now Rasul Douglas is in Buffalo. He's pretty damn good. You have Taron Johnson in the slot. Like This defense has some dudes. It's just a lot of those dudes weren't out there. But when you're an aging defense, you open yourself up to that. So I think get younger, add a dynamic offensive weapon, and... They'll be close. They'll be in the mix. And that's the thing that I think Josh deserves the most credit for. People will always look at the Bills and say, oh, man, here they are. They keep falling just short to the Kansas City Chiefs. They're the only team that's been in the mix every single time for the last four years. They're the only team that has been viewed consistently as a formidable contender to the Chiefs. And they've done that without the most talent in the AFC. And they've done that because of Josh Allen. So I think he deserves credit for that. And I think overall... Pretty remarkable uh, home stretch after what was such a disheartening and embarrassing season for the first two thirds of the regular season. But props to the Chiefs. Logan, I assume that you're feeling pretty good about you having them going to the Super Bowl. And uh, I would certainly be scared to play them. Scared is an understatement. I would be absolutely terrified. DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, is bringing you an offer that'll help make the playoffs electrifying. New customers can bet five bucks on any game and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code NERDS. New customers can bet just five bucks to get 200 instantly in bonus bets only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code NERDS. The crown is yours. Let's move to the other game of the weekend. Because we almost saw an upset of pretty epic proportions. Niners-Packers, Logan. Are you concerned about the Niners after kind of escaping from this one? Definitely, man. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, Brock Purdy in, in really any matchup. Uh, when we think about these great teams, I mean... Again, quarterback is the most important position in football, and you see what quarterbacks can do for you on the biggest stage. Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes just put on a clinic. Like, they dictate so much. And I'm worried about Purdy just on a consistency basis because when the Niners needed him, Brock made plays, and I will give him that credit. When the Niners needed him to come through, he came through. And that's valuable. That's clutch. Mm -hmm. But when you were going to be playing, again, hypothetically, against a Lamar Jackson in a Super Bowl, when you were playing against a Patrick Mahomes in a Super Bowl, we've seen this before. We saw Jimmy Garoppolo. Jimmy Garoppolo had his one shot. Uh, shout out Eminem, man. You get one shot. You know, you gotta, you gotta do it. He missed Emmanuel Sanders. He missed his opportunity to drive the dagger into the heart of the beast that is Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. You can't miss on your opportunity. And I still just think that Brock Purdy is a limiting factor. This shouldn't have been a close game. And Jordan Love didn't play a great game either. You know what I mean? I thought Jordan Love kind of got bailed out too. This was an ugly quarterback performance. And again, the Niners are a stacked team. All of these teams are stacked. These are the best teams in the National Football League, top to bottom. They are some of the best defenses. They have some of the best skill position talent, some of the best lines. The margin for me is going to be the play of the quarterback. And yeah. 
I don't know, Carson. I don't know about how you feel. Brock Purdy has not done nearly enough against high-level competition for me to buy into him as a guy that's going to put him over the top. Against great teams, Brock yeah. Purdy hasn't been there. And yeah. he still really scares me in an individual game scenario where I need to trust him to consistently make plays. Like, I, I thought the Niners should have won this game uh, by more. And again, shout out to him for making crucial plays. Uh, it's deeper than that. you got to be consistent on a drive-to-drive basis. And I still think he is the limiting factor. And he's the reason, Carson, you said it earlier. Whoever comes out of the NFC, uh, I don't think I can pick them to beat whoever yeah. comes out of the AFC. I just think their contender is is much better. Uh, I'm very worried uh, about the Niners. Like, I think on paper, their team is great. I still think Brock limits them. Yeah. He's the one red flag, and he consistently has been. And I've sort of gone – on this arc throughout the year of preseason, the one reason the Niners wouldn't be my pick out of the NFC is that I have less faith in their quarterback than the other teams with elite all-around talent. And then we got to a point midseason where it was like, boy, the Niners are so overwhelmingly dominant and Purdy is playing well enough where I still think they should be the favorite. But now we're back to my fundamental belief, which I probably should have held on to the whole time the Niners were just a buzzsaw for a stretch there, which is that... You need a dude. You need a guy who against another elite football team and probably against an elite quarterback and a damn good defense is going to make those couple special plays. Those couple special plays that set you apart when things do go off schedule and you have to create out of structure. Can you throw into a window that other dudes can't? Can you scramble for 20 yards when other dudes can't? You just need a moment or two like that And do you trust Brock Purdy to deliver those if he's up against Patrick Mahomes, if he's up against Lamar Jackson? Because as great as this football team can be, I still think they're probably going to need that. And the answer is no. And I don't think Brock Purdy sucks, but he definitely had a rough game. He put some balls in harm's way, man. And he looked uncomfortable in that pocket. And early in the second half, he was consistently missing throws, just off target. And on that last drive, he did a good job. He nutted up, and he took care of business. Took the checkdowns consistently, but there's nothing wrong with that. He had plenty of time on the clock. He was aware of the situation. Just keep gaining yardage. He did have that nice scramble once they were inside the 10. It was a good clutch drive. I will say his playmakers also made awesome plays. Jawan Jennings, who was really good in this game, went up and snagged a ball on that last drive. Ayuk made that clutch diving catch on third down. So it was a collective effort on that last drive. It's not like we can just look at that and say, oh my God, Brock Purdy, what amazing plays you made. He took care of business. He did a good job. But overall, I felt like it was the same old story. But honestly, a worse version of it for Brock because this was a game where he was legitimately concerning at points. And you felt like, oh boy, he's going to be the reason that they lose this game. But when they're down 13-7, and they had that two-play sequence where Kittle had that crazy run after the catch, and then McCaffrey had a 40-yard touchdown on the next play. Like, their stars made plays, and that was enough to get them over the top in what was a really shaky game overall. Not a good Shanahan game, not good clock management at the end of the first half. The overall play calling, I thought, early was too spread out. Not enough, hey, McCaffrey, you're our best player. You're one of the best running backs in NFL history. Why don't you just dominate? And it felt like the Packers should have won this game. To me, they dictated this game. Five red zone trips for them to one, Logan. And it felt like LaFleur was kind of big broing Shanahan in this one. He was cooking with the play action and the motion and was hammering the run game to set up those shot plays. So, again, it comes down to a missed field goal in this one. And Jordan Love can't huck that ball across your body at the end. But overall, I just feel like this game scared me more about the Niners and Purdy than it did affirm my faith and I really like the Lions I just still think that defense isn't good enough and they don't have enough of a difference maker at the quarterback position for me to pick them to beat San Francisco so I still think this is a team that makes the Super Bowl but that to me says more about uh, the NFC honestly them having a bye than it does what we saw from them in this game because it felt like the Packers were the better team for most of it. Detroit secondary really does uh, scare me. I-, I won't count them out. I think we're in for a good game. That being said, I won't uh, count them out. Yeah, I-, I think we're due for a good game. Uh, I will say, bottom line with the Niners is that if they do end up winning the Super Bowl uh, somehow, if the Niners get this done, it won't be because of 
Brock Purdy. It's going to be because of these playmakers going above and beyond. And I do want to touch on that final play. Wow, Carson, doesn't that just remind you? Like, I got so many shades of the 2009 NFC title game uh, or the 08, uh, 09. You know what I mean? The the Drew, uh, Drew Brees, uh, Brett Favre game, Viking Saints. Mm-hmm. 09. Uh, I, and, and I know that D-end is bearing down on Jordan Love, but you just can't throw that ball, man. You yeah. either got to tuck it and try to foot race the D-end. You either got to get to the sideline, get out of bounds. You got to throw that ball away. You cannot throw across your body in that situation, but I completely agree with you. Green Bay dictated this game in a way I didn't expect them to, and I mean, I think Detroit's just a better team than Green Bay. Uh, and uh, if I would pick Detroit to win that game, if Detroit was at home, because that is a crazy environment. Yeah. Ford Field has been rocking every single time that they've been there, but. I think I'm going to take San Francisco just because Detroit's not at home. But if they had that advantage, I think I could. Um, But I am scared, man. This is the most human, even after their skid, I think this is the most human that San Francisco has looked all season long. Yeah, because it's in a big spot. And uh, all of the questions about Brock and Shanahan came creeping back. And good for them. They delivered. and, And they escaped this one. But I still think... The questions with Brock remain. And that's what I can't stand about sports analysis. It's what we're talking about with Josh and the Bills. Josh plays a really good game. Josh has consistently played really good games against the Chiefs. The issue has more than anything been the defense. But people look at the quarterback and they just attribute everything to that quarterback. Win, loss, doesn't matter how you played throughout. We see the same thing with Brock Purdy, dude. He was compared to Joe Montana after this. Some dude for The Athletic came out and said that was a Montana-esque drive. That's crazy. It's just insane, dude. He took a bunch of checkdowns. He made one nice play with his legs. He sucked all game other than that. Like, settle down. And I also hate how people, like, conflate the mythology of a franchise with whoever is there right now. All of you goons, all of you idiots. Well, okay, maybe. I don't know. Maybe not. But who are calling (laughs) Purdy Joe Montana very well may have been the same people who were saying that Mac Jones was the next Tom Brady because Logan, lest we forget how loud that crowd was. We cannot forget, Logan. We must not forget history or else we will repeat our errors. And guess what? We're repeating our errors. Not me and you, but a lot of people out there. So just settle down. The NFC is, as uh, Abraham Parnassus would say, Adam Driver on SNL. I don't know if you've ever seen that skit. The NFC is weak like H.R. Pickens. That was a rival oil baron of his. They were competing oil barons, and H.R. Pickens was weak. And uh, that's the NFC this year. I do want to shout out the Packers, though, because what an unbelievable finish to this season. That is a team that is in an awesome position going forward, and uh, boy, they were dangerous. They were dangerous by year's end, and I did feel coming into this game that If one of the uh, one seeds was going to be upset, I definitely felt like it was going to be the Niners by the Packers over the Ravens by the Texans. At the end of the day, Love makes that back-breaking mistake at the end, throws it across his body late into triple coverage, but he hasn't made a mistake like that in 10 weeks. So this is a guy who's been playing incredibly clean football on top of what he's doing as a creator, as an arm talent, as an athlete. He's just been phenomenal. He's stamped as a franchise guy. He is stamped as a top 10 quarterback in this league for a while. Even if you don't think he's necessarily there right now in a fully healthy league, he's on the cusp, and I think he's going to continue to get better. And I can't remember the last time that a quarterback improved this much within a season where five weeks deep, you're legitimately concerned. You're concerned about his future. He's inaccurate. He's inconsistent with his decision-making. The Packers are sputtering as a team, and then he looks like a superstar for the second half of the season. It's so impressive. It's so encouraging. This team is young. They're trending upwards. LaFleur is the man, dude. LaFleur is an offensive genius, mm-hmm. and he he showed his whole bag over these two playoff games, man, and it was really, really impressive. Aaron Jones is still balling. Like, this team is going to be really good next year, and they should be good for the foreseeable future. They weren't supposed to beat the Niners this year. They weren't supposed to beat the Cowboys this year. They weren't really supposed to be in the playoffs this year. So all of that is extremely impressive. Yeah, I think uh, I think Jordan Love is stamped, man. Uh, and I, I don't remember Carson. I can't in my lifetime, at least. I think I'd have to look before uh, I was alive to to look at a 
a turnaround like this. I, I genuinely, this is one of the most impressive uh, turnarounds, and it's, again, a testament to why you cannot ever bail on a quarterback early. You know what? We just didn't have enough tape on the guy. And yeah. uh, I, I do think, I think the Packers are set up for success for the next few years. And, and again, I talk about all the quarterback talent, Carson and the AFC. That means the NFC is kind of wide open. You know what I mean? You don't have to oh, be yeah. the best quarterback in the NFL. It is so loaded that Jordan Love hypothetically could be the best quarterback in the NFC very shortly, and that is legitimately yeah. meaningful for the future. If you were to take a quarterback to be your franchise guy for the rest of his career in the NFC, would Jordan Love be your number one pick right now? I think he would be. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think about other... Dak. Solid candidates. I mean, <laughs> that doesn't move that's, me. <laughs> and that's kind of it, dude. Like, Dak is clearly better right now to me. I know that he's getting slandered out the wazoo for this playoff game, even though, again, that was mostly on an atrocious defensive performance. Dak was not good. He wasn't good at all, but the defense was a disaster. Hurts is the other guy you have to have in that conversation coming off of a down year. Kyler. Like, those are the contenders, I feel like. Those are the dudes who are on the talent level. Other than that, like, what am I going to do with a solid vet like Jared Goff? Like, he, he's not going to grow from here. I think it's probably love for me, too. But honestly, respect to Kyler. And it's tough with Hurts. The reason I think I actually would lean love over Hurts going forward now, I mean, they're the same class. So, And that's another thing. This 2020 draft class is unbelievable. This 2020 draft class has, Logan, call me crazy, it has 83 quarterback class potential. It has 2004 quarterback class potential. Burrow, Herbert, Love, Hurts, and Tua in the same class? Come on, man. Disgusting. But I think it's just the gap as a pure passer and as an arm talent between him and Hurts that, to me, sets him apart. Like, I think Jordan Love is already a clearly better passing quarterback than Jalen Hurts in year one as a starter. So I think he would be the guy for me. And that is a massive win. That is a massive win. And, you know, he may be quarterback seven overall because the AFC is so loaded. But the guy is really, really good, and that was a big question mark coming into the year. So shout out to all of the Jordan Love truthers. You guys were very right. But, Logan, if there is one Baker Mayfield truther in the world, it is you. You are him. And unfortunately, Baker fell short this year. There you are, wearing the Browns shirt jersey. Beautiful coloring, beautiful design. There. <laughs> the Lions win this one. Who did you feel like this game said more about? I think it. I do think. I think it said a lot about Baker Mayfield, man. Baker did play mm -hmm. good. Uh, that's the one thing that I don't want to do because we do this attribution thing, like you said, with Purdy. We do it with Josh Allen. Oh, well, yeah. Brock Purdy won, so he's Joe Montana. And Josh Allen yeah. lost, so he's basically Joe Ferguson. He's an O.J. He's Simpson merchant. You know what I mean? He's yeah, Philip Rivers. He's, Emmanuel he's Ocho a bozo said, because he lost. Emmanuel Ocho said, we may need to come to terms with the fact that Josh Allen may, in fact, be more Philip Rivers than Peyton Manning. Shut up. You're what joking What are you talking me. about? No, I mean, it's Emmanuel Acho, bro. He also said that Tua was the second coming, like he's a clown. But that's the discourse, man. That's where we're headed. And what is the Peyton Manning comp? Peyton, most playoff runs sucked more than he played. I don't really understand that comparison. Oh. Game to game, Logan, in the playoffs, the gap between Josh and Peyton. <laughs> uh, people massive. don't want to hear about it. People don't want to know about it. Josh has game to game been one of the greatest playoff performers ever, but alas, we move on. Yeah, so Baker loses this game, and of course, in Baker Mayfield fashion, oh, uh, shout out uh, Matt Sponauer of uh, Stay Hot, friend of the show, tweeted out Baker was due, and man, that's what I felt like. Like, Baker had gone so above and beyond in this football game, uh, and it did, and I saw Cade. I read that play at the pre-snap, uh, and I said to my friends, I was like, I'm going to throw an out route alert, to Cade Otten. Alert. The out route's going to be open. Um, instead, Cade runs an in-breaking route. Uh, that was the play design. And Baker just forced You could see it coming. I mean, he telegraphs that ball right to the linebacker. Uh, they make a great play. But it, it, honestly, Carson, when, when I say it said a lot to me about Baker, it also said a lot to me about the Lions secondary. The scariest thing about the Detroit Lions, and I want to pick them to win this game, and I want them to get to the Super Bowl, 
because the Lions fans have suffered for so long. Uh, I want them to experience joy and happiness. Hopefully something that the Buffalo Bills fans can experience at one point. Unlikely. There were two clutch drives that Baker Mayfield led that ended in points, in touchdowns, and they took less than two minutes for the Buccaneers to march down the field. They were all big shot plays. Uh, the one at the end of the final, uh, at the end of the first half, that final drive, you got a Trey Palmer one-handed catch on the sideline. You've got the big Baker Mayfield read option. You've got two big Mike Evans shot plays, and then uh, a great play design to get Kate Otten wide open on the left side for that touchdown. Flawless two-minute drill, and they get big points at the end of the first half. And then you got a second-half drive uh, where they go nine plays, 75 yards, a minute 45. I, Clutch drive, man. Uh, Baker hits Mike Evans for a fourth and 14. He's got a pinpoint throw between three defenders to Chris Godwin. I mean, Baker Mayfield played a great game here. Uh, leads another drive to get him close and sets them up to where they had an opportunity at the end of the game. Again, they fall short. And uh, I, I want to criticize Todd Bowles here. I completely misunderstood the call to go for two points in that scenario. You are down eight points. You're potentially going to have one final drive to make this thing happen. Kick the field goal, go down seven, and then if you want to steal the game after you get another touchdown, take the two-point conversion and steal the game there. Don't blow your load. And mm -hmm. you're yeah. setting yourself up for failure where you have to get the two-point conversion to send to overtime. It, to me, it is a uh, very dumb decision by Todd Bowles to go for two there at the end of the game. Uh, you're just okay. Well, first of all, you're stealing all, the thunder from your program. own team. This is a family program, so I'd like you to watch your phrasing there. But second of all, I think the thinking there is it's the classic, all right, we want to know what we need. So you go for it first, and you think, all right, statistically, whatever, two-point conversions have like a 48% success rate. But you think, all right, we've got our best call of the game. It's the playoffs. Maybe we've drawn something special. If we have something we really like, then maybe we feel like we are most likely going to convert here. But if we don't, and if we do convert, then boom. If we score again, we've won the game. We just got to make an extra point unless we have Tyler Bass out there. But if we don't get it, then we know that we need to go for two. So I think that that's the thinking there. Well, well and here's my thinking is you kick the field goal here, you go down seven. Like, I'm just saying is you're giving yourself an option later. You're giving mm -hmm. yourself a door and a window to get out of this game. By going yeah. for two and you're handcuffing yourself to having to escape through the window. You get what I'm saying? Like, I just think mm, poetry. you're limiting yourself for later in the game when you have opportunities. Um, that being said, that is the one thing that really scares me about the Detroit Lions is the fact that, uh, that they were so susceptible to quick strike, big play opportunities. Yeah. And, I, you know, I expected Tampa Bay to connect on these. Their secondary has been weak. Uh uh, like H.R. Pickens. And I think the difference in this game, too, H.R. <laughs> <HR> Pickens. <laughs> I think the big difference in this game, uh, Jamel Dean's injury uh, left the Buccaneers kind of open on the back end. I think that was a huge factor. I thought he played such a great game. Uh, and I think the Lions played an awesome offensive game, too. Uh, ben Johnson was dialing up play after play. Uh, I, mean, I mean, just great decisions. The one third down to Brock Wright where he gets open. Uh, it, ben Johnson was in his bag this game. And so I want to give a ton of credit to him. I want to give a ton of credit to Aaron Glenn, too, uh, for dialing up secondary blitzes. I thought Baker uh, was really hurried all night um, when they would dial up a corner or a secondary coming off or a, a defensive back coming off the edge. Baker never saw those guys. And I think that is going to be crucial against San Francisco, dialing up some of those timely blitzes. But that's still the Achilles heel to this team to me, Carson, and something that scares me. With all these playmakers that San Francisco has – if Shanahan can dial up the perfect play at the perfect time, uh, I think the Niners are going to hit on a lot of shot plays that could kill Detroit. It didn't kill them against Tampa Bay because that's Baker Mayfield. This is an inferior team. I think it will come back to bite them against San Francisco because I do think they're the better team. Uh, Detroit's really good, but those big shot plays and those quick strike drives, again, two drives that went over 75 yards in less than two minutes that ended in points, both drives, that is terrifying to me and something that Detroit has to clean up if they want to get to the Super Bowl. I totally agree. It is uh, their big red flag. It is their big limitation as a football team, and it does still inhibit them from being a real contender in my eyes. You look at the other three teams that are still out there, 
elite defenses. Two of them with elite quarterbacks. That's the formula. Really good offense in versatile offense where you can run the ball down people's throats or you can dominate as a passing attack when golf is on, when golf is good. That's great, but they're going to struggle to get stops against anybody. And I can guarantee you they're going to struggle to get stops against the San Francisco 49ers. And I don't think that they're going to get many of them. So that's the takeaway for Detroit. It's been the same limiting factor this year. It is awesome that they are here. It is awesome that golf has been really good through two games and all this stuff. I'm so happy for them. I'm so happy for Dan Campbell, everybody from the 313. Put your motherfucking hands up and follow me. I got my beanie on. Like, shout outs to, to everybody there. But uh, that's going to be the thing that, to me, keeps them from being a real threat. Like, out of the four teams left to me, they're pretty clearly fourth in terms of their Super Bowl upside. For the Bucks, uh, there's not really a whole bunch of takeaways here. It was a win for them to get to this point. It was a win for them to have a chance in this game. This is a team that I thought was going to be one of the worst in the NFL. And you've now figured out that Baker is your guy, at least as a bridge quarterback, at least for a couple years. Like, he's going to keep you really competitive if your defense plays well. Mike Evans is still a stud. Like, good for them, dude. I don't think that there's anything really but positive takeaways from this year unless like you've now talked yourself into oh my god baker is the guy he's our franchise quarterback for the next half decade then i think you need to settle down because yeah this is going to happen like as you're saying he was due and he had that ball in the first half in the end zone literally right in a defensive player's hands and he just got bailed out by a drop but it's a very very impressive season for them i will say of course missed field goal in this game chase mclaughlin 50 yards and That's one more thing that I'll say about Tyler Bass, okay? Everybody's going to throw out the Scotty Norwood comparisons. We're back to the Bills game. We're back. Everybody's going to talk about wide right. Listen, missing from 44 yards in 1990, okay, that was like the equivalent of 68 yards today, okay? Everybody back then had polio. Everybody was drunk. They had left left feet. I'm pretty sure Mm -hmm, Scotty Norwood mm -hmm. was smoking a cigar as he went up to kick it. Okay, 44 yards today, it's a field goal. It's a gimme. It's an extra point. You're supposed to make it. Kickers, man. Kickers. The agony of defeat. All right, last game, Logan. Ravens-Texans. This was just a good old-fashioned shellacking, really. Just a a stud one seed against a really fun young team showing them who was who and giving them the business. How impressed were you by the Ravens? I was very impressed with the Ravens, and uh, I just want to give a, a big shout out to Lamar Jackson because again, uh, big another playoff win under his belt. I think he needed it. Mm-hmm. Big Truss, woo woo. I think he is top woo-woo. three. I, I want to start calling. Uh, I want to call Lamar Jackson a uh, low jack man, like the uh, stuff you put on the bottom of a car. He's gonna find that like receiver. Man. He is gonna find like him Bo-Jack if he's Horseman open. With an L. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, man. Yeah. I was so impressed with Lamar's ability to extend plays, to find the open guy. I, don't take Lamar for granted, man. He is such a great one-man offense. And, and the thing that is just so remarkable, Carson, is the, the, the how methodical they are. Like, I, I, you know, I'm always impressed mm-hmm. with Pat, with Josh. Like, the Ravens just don't ever feel like uh, – they don't ever feel like they're under pressure. The Ravens never feel like they're – ever under duress or war there's such a level of control with baltimore at the line of scrimmage that i get defensively that i get offensively there's a quiet confidence and feel to this team like again i I, there's not a number that i can quantify to you but there's a level of control that i get with lamar that i get with this team this this level of poise that that does scare me if there is a team that is going to knock off patrick mahomes well, obviously, because we're down to two more football games in this season, it's either going to be the NFC team or it's going to be the AFC team, to state Good the point. obvious. Good but point. it really does feel like it really does feel like the Ravens are the team that is most well equipped because they have so many defensive playmakers. You know, they have more than a starting defense uh, worth of Pro Bowl players, as you mentioned, Carson. Like they have more than eleven guys that you can trot out there that are superstars defensively that can cause issues and then on the other side you've got that superstar quarterback uh yeah Baltimore to me is concretely one of the best teams in football Lamar Jackson and this team just have such a level of control and again Carson the thing that scares you about the Niners right 
the Packers didn't feel like they were on the level of the Niners talent-wise, right? And they didn't handle business. The Ravens did. The Texans felt inferior, and they handled business. It was 10-10 to at half, and then they scored 24 unanswered, and they emphatically shut the door. That's what I like to see from my contenders, is they don't play with their food. They ate them up. They devoured the yeah. Texans, and I, I like that kind of response. Uh, Baltimore is is for real, and put some respect on uh, on Lamar Jackson. Yeah. They don't have a weakness. That's the difference. That's why I was so much more confident in them taking care of business. There's not going to be a game where the quarterback position is shaky and you're concerned about it. And that's what's so funny about the Lamar discourse. This is another guy where, with some people at least, these like year-old criticisms from when he was a different player, from when he was a less refined passer, are still lingering. When I got on my flight to Rochester, my second flight, uh, it was a hilarious conversation that I overheard immediately because, you know, everybody in Western New York, all that they have really is Bills football. So it's all they're talking about and thinking about 50% of the people on the flight at least are in Bills gear. And there's this guy literally talking about a Bills Steelers game in 1974. He's like, yeah, they had LC Greenwood, Dwight White. And then he started talking about how Hank Stram was his favorite coach. But that guy also offered the sound analysis that, well, yeah, whoever wins this game is going to be playing the Texans because uh, Lamar's only one and three in his playoff career. And I'm like, all right, buddy. Yeah, maybe it's not that simple. Maybe Lamar is uh, him times a thousand. And he is. And then after this game, there's some schmuck Dolphins guy. I guess I'm just mad at football discourse this episode, Logan, because a lot of it is really stupid. And a lot of it just involves illogical thinking and misattribution of credit and blame. The guy tweets out about how, oh, Lamar just won a playoff game throwing 152 yards. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if Tua could do that? I mean, really, is that all that impressive? And it's like, bro, are you watching the game at all? Do you have any idea what's going on out there? Like, so efficient as a passer, two touchdowns through the air, rushes for 100 yards and two touchdowns. Like, he dominated the game, and he was in absolute control. That's the thing, Logan. Like, this Chiefs offense, the last two weeks, has looked a lot better. Against the Bills, it looked the best that it has all year. I think of that as a healthy combination of playoff Mahomes and a very banged-up Bills defense. But nobody has more been more consistently brilliant than this Ravens offense. And, and that was the case throughout this game. And even at halftime, yeah, it's 10-10, but that's because of a punt return touchdown. Like, it never felt like these were two even teams to me. And it didn't feel like these were two even quarterbacks. As much as I love CJ against the defense of this caliber, man, you're just you're swimming upstream. And that's the thing about the Ravens. They can beat you in so many ways because they are so damn good at everything. They are the best rushing attack in football. I mean, they're great just conventionally on the ground. Awesome line. Good running back play. But because of what Lamar does as a dual threat, they are always going to be the most productive rushing attack in football. They now have a dude who has consistently given you elite efficiency as a passer and shown elite traits in terms of arm, talent, his accuracy, timing is so good, his uh, instincts outside of the pocket as they throw her downfield, remarkable, and then they're the best defense in the league. And if there's one quote-unquote weakness here, it would be the run game, the run defense for the Ravens, and they just shut down the Texans. The Texans don't run the ball well, but uh, they shut them down. They had nothing there. They became a one-dimensional offense, and then... They took away the shot plays. They took away the shot plays that have been the bread and butter for the Texans all year. And so they were just kind of left completely outmatched. And you can't be surprised by that because Baltimore is special. And I think that they are the best team in the field. And as crazy as it feels and sounds, with the level that Lamar is playing at on what I think is a better all-around football team, I think I'm going to take him to beat the Chiefs. But that scares the hell out of me because Patrick Mahomes is the best football player I've ever seen. Well said. And they did get, I mean, I think the key's got to be that they got a lot of pressure on C.J. Stroud late, too. They can, they're going to have to put a ton of pressure on Mahomes. Easier said than done, but uh, I do think yeah. this is the best defense in the field. Uh, I just hope that I just hope that whatever game we get in the AFC title game isn't as good as the Super Bowl. I want the Super Bowl to be the best game that we get this year, because Bills, Bills Chiefs certainly felt yeah. like a Super Bowl-type game, you know? I think that what you tweeted out was very wise and what you said at the top of this show, like there has not been a more consistently great quarterback battle than 
Mahomes Allen. It's unbelievable. These two dudes play at such a high level every single outing. And that's the thing about Josh. That's what I try to tell people about Josh, Logan. You get the best version of Josh in the playoffs because he stops dicking around. You don't go up big against the Jets team without Aaron Rodgers and start thinking, hey, what happens if I just huck the ball downfield? He takes every play seriously. He understands the gravity of the moment. He protects the football, and he still does the special stuff. And that has just led to some really consistently special matchups. For the Texans, it's similar to the Packers. You have your stud at quarterback. That's the takeaway of the season. That's awesome. Both of them have fantastic coaches. Both of them have weapons, who I feel good about. Young weapons, especially the Texans. Nico Collins is awesome, and when Tank Dell gets back, he's awesome. So they have a lot of foundational pieces. The Texans have, to me, their two edge rushers of the foreseeable future with Will Anderson and Grenard, and they have a ton of cap space, ton of cap space, so they can just load up more on that defense. Hopefully they can improve this line a bit and ideally get a running back who's better than Devin Singletary so that can become more of a balanced offense, a two-dimensional offense, and then you're good. You're going to be in the mix for uh, for a while. Bad news is you have to go through Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same thing for everybody. Like Those Super Bowl bids out of the AFC are going to be immensely valuable. They're going to be the holy grail, man. They are going to be hard to come by, and it is going to be a pilgrimage to get there every single time. And the Texans still have work to do to be in that conversation, but going from three wins to 10 and a playoff win and having the best rookie quarterback ever, in my opinion, what a season. Yeah, and I don't think they're that far off, Carson. I mean, imagine you beef up this O-line, you get prepared to to be strong against these teams in the trenches, and I think you're right, dude. I haven't really looked at this NFL draft class yet, but I would get a receiving running back for uh, mm. for CJ. I think that would be super valuable. Another release valve uh, in the flats, like I think it would fully unlock CJ as a passer. The future, the future is very bright for Houston and Carson. If they can get one of those high seeds, I really like Houston hosting playoff games there at Energy. Man, that place. Uh, that place was really loud in the wild card, and I think that could be one hell of a home field advantage for them. Yeah, it turns out in Texas, Logan, they love their football. Do they ever? And everything's bigger there. I don't know if you heard. So the future is bright, and the sun will rise another day. It already has for Bills fans, for Packers fans, for those who were gutted in a rough fashion this weekend. That's what happens in playoff football, and the sun will rise another day. To the Baker Mayfield fans out there, the sun will rise another day. And I leave you all with that message. Uh, highlight of the week for me going forward, the redeeming moment hopefully will be Logan doing a uh, five-minute set at a oh, uh, local gosh. spot in Phoenix at an open mic. I have written a rough draft of his script. It is cringe-inducing beyond words. And I think that it will be lovely to see our buddy over there perform it. I'm excited. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Silver linings, baby. As Bradley Cooper said, silver linings. Playbook. I thought maybe you would have something to add to that, but it looks like you don't. It looks like you're just upset about yeah, the fact um, that you're going to get to do a wonderful performance. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be at Joe Bot Coffee, guys. Uh, somewhere between 8 and 11 o'clock uh, Thursday night. Pop out. Downtown Phoenix. It will be uh, it will be electric. Uh, I want everyone, Pull if through. you do pop out, please viciously Boo me. Boo me as hard as humanly <laughs> possible. Thank you. My biggest concern is you getting through the set. I am legitimately worried that someone is going to yank you off. Not like that, of course. Someone is going to pull you off stage uh, because this is going to be a rough watch. But, yeah, any of our Phoenix fans definitely pull through. Okay, that's going to do it for us here today, guys. Hope you enjoyed, as always. If you did, I mean, the good, news is, the good news is that there is more Nerd Sesh content everywhere. Really, YouTube, our full shows with video. We're doing video essays on the NBA there. You can listen to the podcast across audio platforms. You can follow us across social, TikTok and Instagram, at Nerd Sesh, Twitter, at Nerd underscore Sesh. Uh, trivia content there galore, clips from the show. You can check out our Discord if you want. That is the link tree across our social media bios. Join there. Become part of our community, talk NBA, NFL with the fellas. And you can cop some Nerd Sesh merch. Logan's got the hat on. All of that at thevolume.com. So with that, appreciate you guys. As always, I've been Carson Breber. I've been Logan Camden.
and this was Nerd Sesh.